Near the close of the 1800s, 12 men convened in Washington, D.C., in the basement of the Department of Agriculture's office. These men were joined with one goal, to eat. And while the menu was varied and the chef that prepared the food was well-versed, having served once for the Queen of Bavaria, something was off. The young men seated at a dark wooden table covered in white linen cloth had been chosen from a list of hundreds of applicants, eager to be served their promised three square meals a day. The meals included a wide-spanning ingredient list, ingredients that included poison. These men were highly sought after, screened for high moral character with reputations of reliability, and all had full knowledge of the fact that the food they were to consume would harm them and could even kill them. This is the story of the Poison Squad, who played a key role in cleaning up America's food industry. And this is Learn Something New. When Upton Sinclair was just 28 years old, he published his novel titled The Jungle as a way to bring more attention to both the work conditions that immigrants who settled in America dealt with, as well as detailing the horrible conditions of the meat industry in America, which he had researched by visiting several stockyards that processed animal meat, notably going to the Chicago Union Stockyard, which, just upstream from downtown Chicago, was a square mile of animal processing facilities slaughtering 18 million animals in a single year at their peak. Once called the hog butcher for the world, this facility provided growth and many jobs to the immigrants who settled in the Windy City. And after spending seven weeks at places like this one and interviewing workers, Sinclair began his work of fiction. Though fiction it was, many of the descriptions of what was being done to the meat that fed the world were very much the opposite. Though The Jungle was actually a fictional novel about a Lithuanian immigrant family enduring tragedies from unemployment to imprisonment and alcoholism, it was the descriptions of the facilities that really struck a chord. Sinclair would go on to say about his book, I aimed at the public's heart, and by accident, I hid it in its stomach. For decades before Sinclair wrote The Jungle, Congress had already tried several times to regulate the food industry, but nothing ever really seemed to stick but the outrage that the book garnered pushed many to immediate action, most notable of which was President Theodore Roosevelt, who was livid upon reading what was happening to America's food supply. Teddy Roosevelt was already well aware of who Upton Sinclair was, having already spoken out against the author as Roosevelt was opposed to Sinclair's socialist ideologies. But the president had already had a run-in with the meatpacking industry that made him convinced that what was written in the jungle was the truth. You see, years prior, meat packers had sold putrid meat to the US military during the Spanish-American War, and it didn't take long for the 337 tons of chemically embalmed meat to start having an effect on the troops, making them grow sick and unable to fight. Some even died. Roosevelt knew of this event well, because he himself was a colonel in Cuba who ate the tainted meat. With this in mind, Roosevelt summoned Sinclair to the White House. While they worked to develop a plan to counter the meat industry, Roosevelt sent investigators to Chicago's stockyards. Apparently, what they found there they claimed was worse than that which was described in the jungle. With one of the investigators, Charles Neal, saying that for the rest of his life, he would not feed his family meat unless it came fresh from a local farm. The two investigators gave the Neal Reynolds report to the president and Sinclair, but shortly after, fearing that the president wouldn't act quick enough on the report, Sinclair leaked it to the New York Times. Roosevelt sent Sinclair back home soon after, but within a month, the president was making his own moves regardless. At that point, Germany and France had banned all American meat products and the British had banned the importing of canned meat. Roosevelt used this to convince Congress to agree to the Meat Inspection Act. It's between these two men, Sinclair and Roosevelt, that credit for the act's passing is often given full credit. But this story misses a key figure, someone who rallied others to help expose some of the worst chemical preservatives pervasive throughout America's food supply, the man who formed the Poison Squad. R.V. Washington Wiley was born in a log cabin on April 16, 1844. His father was a farmer, who also tended to preach in the southern Indiana region, and at one time worked as part of the Underground Railroad, sheltering escaped slaves as they moved north. Wiley would go on to take inspiration from his father's efforts, serving in the Civil War before studying chemistry at Harvard, becoming the first chemistry professor at Purdue University in 1874. As he taught, he noticed that new techniques developed during the Industrial Revolution for the industrialization of the food supply 
often were not only harmful, but often fraudulent depictions of the food they were disguised as. Initially, he was tipped off about the oddities of the food industry when he began analyzing the syrups for sale in his state. He found that many of these products, such as maple syrup or honey, were adulterated with corn syrup. Some, in fact, were nothing but corn syrup. If the industry was willing to misrepresent their products, what else would they be willing to do? As he would soon find out, Americans were consuming formaldehyde, borax, and salicylic acid for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. He had found his calling. He was named the United States' chief chemist in 1882 and began investigating more rumors about the horrible things companies were trying to pass off as food. He found pepper made from sawdust, cocoa powder containing iron oxides, flour laced with powdered white rocks that had been ground up, cinnamon that was really just red brick dust, whiskey that was watered down ethyl alcohol, tinted brown with some prune juice. He found coffee that contained bits of sand, tree bark, charcoal, and even bits of charred bone. And this was far from an exhaustive list. It wasn't long before he realized just how dire the situation really was. And he needed to figure out the extent of danger that people were in from consuming these horrid ingredients. And to do this, he needed people to test them on in a controlled setting. In 1902, when the group that ate at the table first convened, it didn't have a name. Its leader, Dr. Harvey Wiley, referred to the project as the Hygienic Table Trials. But it wasn't long before the Washington Post reporter, George Rothwell Brown, came up with a better name, the Poison Squad. The goal of the Poison Squad was simple. They were tasked with trying some of the most commonly used food additives in order to determine their effects. During each of the Poison Squad's trials, the members would eat steadily increasing amounts of each additive, carefully tracking the impact that it had on their bodies, though they would stop when members started to get too sick. The human lab rats were 12 young clerks, vigorous and voracious. All were screened for high moral character and all had reputations for sobriety and reliability so as not to risk the corporations they were judging from trying to pay any of them off. All 12 took oaths, pledging one year of service, promising to only eat food that was prepared in the Poison Squad's kitchen, and waiving their right to sue the government for any damages, including death, that might result from their participation in the program. Squad members needed a lot of patience. Before each meal, they had to weigh themselves, take their temperatures, and check their pulse rates. Their stool, urine, hair, and sweat were all collected and they had to submit to weekly physicals, and they were extremely strict about what they collected. When one member of the Poison Squad got a haircut without permission, he was allegedly sent back to the barber with orders to collect his cut hair so that it might be studied. And most of the squad members didn't get extra pay for their hazardous duty. In return for their patience and obedience, they received just the three square meals a day, all of which were carefully poisoned. They went through borax, one of the most common food preservatives at the time, sulfuric acid, saltpeter, and formaldehyde, copper sulfate, which was produced in order to make canned peas more green, and was one of the most dangerous ones they had tested. The effects of copper sulfate were so severe that they couldn't even finish the trial. And when the group tested benzoic acid, the damage to their bodies was so intense that the Secretary of Agriculture tried to suppress their report for fear of what the public might think of its widespread use. Wiley was only able to get the staffer to send it out because the secretary was on vacation. And the efforts of the men eventually paid off, as with the help of Sinclair and President Roosevelt, along with over one million letters sent to Congress about the food conditions that had been reported on, Congress successfully passed the Meat Inspection Act and the Pure Food and Drug Act, aimed at food regulation, and the Poison Squad closed up shop less than a year later. In the end, Wiley would pass away on June 30th, 1930, on the 24th anniversary of the passage of the Pure Food and Drug Act, and was buried alongside his wife in Arlington National Cemetery. His work isn't well known, but its prominence at the time was at the center of a campaign to convince the government just how serious the health of the public was. And his fight to make the truth known would earn him the title as the father of the FDA. Thanks for watching. If you liked this video, consider liking, subscribing, and sharing it. Thanks again, and I will see you in the next one.